Collingwood, of course. <laughs> Uh, so, and there's a door prize to the grand final for next year, and so it's a uh, high stakes, so please make sure that you're there. Now, it's my uh, great honour to introduce our next speaker, um, which uh, Robert West is Professor of Health Psychology and Director of Tobacco Studies at the Cancer Research UK Health Behaviour Research Centre, University of College of London. Robert West completed his PhD in psychology in 1983 at University College London and worked as a postdoctoral researcher in the area of smoking at the Institute of Psychiatry until 1985 when he took up a lecturing position at Royal Holloway London University. He continued his research into smoking and also began researching traffic incident uh, accident involvement. In 1991, Professor West joined St George's University of London, where he was made professor in 1996. He took up his present position in 2003. Professor West's research includes clinical trials of uh, new smoking cessation treatments, studies of the acute effects of cigarette withdrawal, and population studies of smoking patterns. He's published more than 300 scientific works and is co-author of the English and Scottish National Smoking Cessation Guidelines that provided the blueprint for the UK-wide network of smoking cessation services that are now an established part of the National Health Service. Professor West is co-director of the NHS Centre for Smoking Cessation and Training, a member of the Board of Trustees of QUIT, a member of the editorial board for the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco, a World Health Organisation Tobacco Treatment Database, a member of the editorial board for the, of the Cochrane Collaboration Tobacco Review Group, and is editor-in-chief of the journal Addiction. He's also the past president of the Society for Research in Nicotine and Tobacco. Please join with me in welcoming Professor Robert West. Well, thank you very much indeed. You know, you know how um, apparently when you're just about to drown, you see your life flash before you in your, uh, in your eyes. Um, I had that sort of sensation, but uh, hopefully the, the latter thing won't come true. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do in the next 40 minutes, and I intend to leave um, min uh, some time for questions at the end, is to address this uh, thorny subject of uh, the extent to which and in what way uh, we should be thinking about offering uh, tobacco use cessation treatment for people who are not coming to us, for, or you for that necessarily, uh, but coming to you for help with um, dealing with their drug and alcohol problems. And I've just come out of a, uh, a symposium uh, um, uh, this afternoon, um, which addressed that very topic and um, uh, was led by the group at Newcastle who are doing some um, uh, amazing work in this area and I think we'll take it forward uh, quite considerably. So um, what I want to do in this... How did I... What? I press which is forward and which is back? Oh, ah, the one which says forward is forward and back is back. This is where I was going wrong. Okay. Um, so, what I'm going to do in, in, in this time is just to provide a very uh, synoptic overview of my reading of the literature in this area and present you with uh, a few bits of data. Um, but I want to start with a challenge, in a way. Um, I want to know what you think. Um, and some of you who recognize the way in which the word yes is written may be aware that I'm a bit of a prog rock fan. Uh, so, um, and for those of you who are too young, forget about it anyway. Um, so this is, this is not a trivial question because if we're going to do this, it's going to cost money and it's going to take up resources and there are opportunity costs and so on. So the question is, and I'm not actually going to ask for a show of hands, I'm going to ask you to think about this in your, in your heads and then we'll come back to it at the end. Um, what do we think? First of all, should we just forget the whole thing? No, uh, we shouldn't be doing it and what's more, there's no point in researching it. No, we shouldn't be doing it, but let's do the research collect the data, find out whether it's going to be worthwhile, and then maybe we can think about it. Or should we be doing it, but at the same time doing the research that will be needed to give it 
uh, the kind of scientific backing that uh, it might need or find out how to do it better? Um, or should we just do it and forget the research? I know there are many people who work in the field of tobacco control, for example, who are not very interested in research. They just say, just get on with it. Don't waste your time doing all this research stuff. It isn't a waste of time. We just need mass media campaigns. We just need to put taxes up. We need to do X, Y, and Z. Um, it's a view. So, um, so all of you, I hope, will have come to a, uh, a view yourselves about that. And I'm not interested in what the percentages are, only in your own internal uh, working. So, so, okay, so what, what kind of factors might go into uh, that kind of uh, decision? No, because, okay, here are, here are some of the arguments, um, because the gains of stopping are just too small, um, it's not a priority. This is a group with other things on their mind, and uh, tobacco, yes, it's important for the general population, but not for this group. No, because there's not enough demand. People are not interested, um, we... we you can try to offer it to them, but not enough people will take it up to make it worthwhile. No, because it won't work. It doesn't matter even if there was a demand, um, because uh, we just don't have things that we, can, uh, that we can offer them that will make a difference. Uh, no, because it'll get in the way of our other treatment. It'll um, undermine what we're trying to do with their more immediate problem of uh, drug and alcohol problems. Or no, because all of those things are fine, but it's just not practicable. It's not something we can get integrated into our systems. Or we can decide yes, because the benefits are significant. Because in fact, many clients would take it up if it were offered. Um, because many people would stop smoking who wouldn't have stopped otherwise. And if you bear in mind that for every smoker who is led to stop by something you did, who wouldn't have stopped otherwise, or every two smokers, you've just saved a life. Not many people in the health service save that number of lives or have that kind of hit rate. So if you can get people to stop, the, the impact on people's lives is huge. Um, it may mitigate their other problems. It may turn out that actually it makes things better. It makes it easier for them to stop their drug and alcohol problems. And, and maybe yes, because it can be made to work, because where there's a will, there's a way. Right, now I'm just going to talk a little bit about epistemology. Um, in our field, and in many other areas that we work in, in uh, social sciences and clinical science and epidemiology, we don't really know things, but we do uh, have different kinds of knowledge. There are things we think we know, there are things we think, and there are things we think we don't know. Sound like Donald Rumsfeld, if you know the famous uh, statement. But, um, and one of the problems I think we sometimes face is that in striving after things that we're going to say that we, be, that we know, which may be unattainable, we forget about the important advances that we can make in what we think, which can make a difference to people's lives. So when we, I was very struck by John Marsden's um, presentation yesterday about um, uh, adaptive interventions and RCTs and meta-analysis. I think, as some of you probably al already think yourselves, that uh, the hegemony of the RCT, which is very important and has a very important role to play, uh, is something that we need to challenge a little bit and we need to start thinking or getting the powers that be to think more creatively about the kind of methodological tools that are appropriate for the issues that we have to face. And it's important to be clear about what we can achieve in this area because if we get it wrong, we waste huge amounts of resources. Um, so we need to know what kind of a knowledge we can aspire to and we also need to know what kind of knowledge how to use the kind of knowledge that we've got. Uh, and what that means, for example, is that when we only think something, then it's important for us to monitor that and keep monitoring it because we might be wrong. So when I hear someone, when I hear a researcher or someone applying for an interview with me going, I passionately believe something which they shouldn't passionately believe, they should think it and then be willing to uh, deny it if it turns out that the evidence points the other way. Um, when I hear that, I get worried. And if they're applying for a job with me, they don't get the job. So you might want to bear that in mind. Um, so um, you can pa I passionately believe lots of things, but not 
in that domain. Okay, so what am I going to talk about briefly? Um, I'm going to uh, review what I understand of the literature on the likely benefits from stopping smoking in this group. What are the chances of people in this group quitting? Uh, the likely take-up of offer of help with quitting in this group? How effective the smoking cessation support's likely to be? Uh, will the offer of help have adverse effects on their drug and alcohol use? And uh, how can we um, uh, make the offer or, uh, routine and integrated within clinical practice? And all I'm going to do is to uh, present you with the results of a rapid review that I've done for the purposes of this talk, um, which uh, leads me to think certain things. Okay, well, let's just look at the benefits of stopping. A very important statistic. Uh, it's just another way of presenting data that many of us are familiar with, but it's very important in communicating the risks, is that for a, a young, middle-aged adult, someone in their 30s and above, every single day that they carry on smoking, they lose six hours of life expectancy on average. Every single day that they carry on smoking. For every week they lose several days. For every month, they lose a week. For every year, they lose uh, three months. It's really urgent for them to stop now, not wait another year. They wait another year, they've just lost three months of life expectancy. Okay, so this is not something that can be put off. Um, in addition, it's not just about life expectancy, it's about improved health and functioning. Uh, I, I won't present the data, but uh, we've been recently looking at large... Um, uh, results, from a large, results from a large survey that we've been carrying out in England in which your average 45-year-old smoker in terms of their health-related quality of life looks like a 55-year-old a non-smoker. Smoking isn't just killing people early, it's ruining their lives. It's turning young people into old people and then killing them. Um, we also found in the work that we... I know. So it's not all bad then. Uh, <laughs> Um, we've also found that, in, uh, that if you look at people and you follow them up when they stop smoking, they, at least 70% of them actually score higher on measures of life satisfaction and happiness. Uh, we, we've been doing some work from a multinational cohort study in which you see improvements in mental health. And of course you get greater disposable income, and this is a group that really needs that. So these are just uh, data from the famous Dolan Pito uh, study from the BMJ uh, following people up the doctors up for 50 years. And some of you may have heard uh, that um, Richard Pito recently published in the Lancet uh, uh, findings from the Million Women study, which showed almost exactly the same thing. And the way that Richard Pito put it is that if women smoke like men, they die like men. And uh, effectively, what they showed was that if you can get people to stop young, you can recover almost all the life expectancy. Um, what about the health gains in people with alcohol and substance use disorders? There isn't a whole lot of data on that. There isn't the same kind of data. This is a much smaller group, so it's harder to get the data. But there are data on it. And uh, as you will have heard if you've been in the symposium uh, this afternoon, that uh, uh, the, there is research which shows that the majority of premature deaths in people with alcohol and drug use problems occur from smoking-related diseases. So this is an urgent and severe problem. These people are heavier smokers. On the other hand, uh, you might argue uh, that because of the risk of a very more, a more immediate premature death from uh, what they're doing, that, that that might mitigate the benefits. But on average, it looks as though the benefits from stopping are very substantial. What about the rates of quitting and smokers in general to begin with? And then uh, we'll look at uh, people with alcohol and substance use disorders. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, even in the general population, the rate at which people stop in countries like Australia and in the United Kingdom are about 1% to 2% of smokers a year. Okay, only 1% to 2% of smokers. A lot of people are trying, but many people, the vast majority of those are not succeeding. Um, it turns out that in England anyway, um, more women tend to try than men, particularly in the uh, young adult uh, age group. Um, the success rates are very similar. There's a lot of talk out there that women find it harder to stop. And if you look at clinical samples, uh, people attending stop smoking treatment services, you find lower success rates in women. But if you, see, if you look at the population data, then there's no difference between them. Women find it as hard uh, to stop, but no harder on average than men do. Uh, 
Also, very interestingly, uh, we find that people who are anxiety and uh, or, uh, anxious or depressed are not less likely to try to stop, even though you might imagine that they would be because they've got other things on their mind. Um, they're just as likely to try to stop. It's just that the success rates are worse. So this is not a question of motivating this group to try to stop. It's a question of giving them support and help to help them succeed. We also find, uh, in, in England certainly, that um, the same proportion of people across the whole social spectrum are, are trying to stop. It's not that the poorest members of the community are not engaged with the health message. They are engaged with it, uh, and they're highly motivated to stop, but their success rates are lower. Again, it addresses the issue of, um, of ability to stop rather than motivation to stop. So what I've done for the purpose of this talk is to look at PubMed, Web of Science, and Scholar Google to try to get a picture for you. It's not a comprehensive review, but, it's, uh, but I think the picture is tying in very much with the kind of uh, results that um, we heard about uh, in the symposium earlier today. Um, a picture of, of where things stand in the, in the um, alcohol and substance use disorder groups. Um, so we've got PubMed, Web of Science, Google, uh, Google Scholar. Um, I put in alcohol and sub or substance as search terms and use disorder and smoking cessation. And I, looked, uh, I focused down on prevalence, efficacy, and implementation and effects. And I'm going to show you the studies and some, uh, and some reviews. I'm just going to rattle through them because the, the message that they produce, uh, that, they, that they create, is, is fairly consistent and... Um, uh, but I'm, the reason I'm showing them individually to you is because there's so few studies in this area that, I could, that one can actually do that. Okay, so if we go back to 1988, um, uh, there was, it was already um, found that people with more severe um, alcohol use disorder were less likely to see at stopping smoking when they try. And this is a consistent pattern uh, that we observe ever since. Um, interestingly... Uh, if you look at recovering alcoholics, people who have uh, uh, been abstinent from alcohol for some time, then there is research which uh, seems to be showing similar rates of success at stopping, except when there is depression associated with it. So it's a more complicated and nuanced picture than uh, it appears at first sight. But it's important to bear in mind this issue that the people who are in remission or recovering from alcohol use disorders seem to have similar rates to other smokers. Uh, we know that the nicotine dependence scores are higher in people with alcohol use disorder. Um, uh, people with uh, Hayes and, and others in 1999 found that people with past and current um, alcohol use disorder were, um, seemed to have a, a lower chance of um, short-term success in stopping uh, when they were treated with nicotine replacement therapy. Um, Dawson in 2000 and, uh, the year 2000 found that people with alcohol use disorder uh, were less likely than those without to, uh, to stop smoking. So the, pit, the, the picture is, is emerging. Um, Kalman uh, found that success rates appeared very low in smokers undergoing inpatient treatment for alcohol use disorder um, with limited behavioral support. Now, in that study, uh, they did provide some support and help, and this is an important message I'm going to come back to right at the end. The support they provided was quite limited, and I think there's a serious question about whether if we're going to do this, we've got to do it properly, because if we do it in a way that is not really addressing the dependent's need, then we might as well save ourselves the time and the trouble and save them the effort. Um, uh, Karam Haig in 2005 found that stopping smoking unaided following treatment uh, for people with um, alcohol use disorder was not uncommon. That means there was a certain amount of spontaneous cessation. Um, and it was more likely in those who were abstinent at the end of treatment. Richter in 2005 found long-term smoking abstinence rates uh, were not unreasonable. They were reasonably high rates after a motivational interviewing intervention and pharmacological treatment for smoking cessation in substance use disorder patients. And then moving more up to the present day, um, uh, Agosti in 2009 found that remission from alcohol or substance use disorder was associated with a higher rate of smoking cessation. So if people can uh, get uh, at least recover to some degree from their other problems, then this helps. Um, and uh, I won't uh, go into the, the other details. By the way, all of these slides you can just download from my website probably after tomorrow when I've had a chance to put them on. Um, 
Again, I'm not going to go into the details of, uh, of these studies, but just to say that, that very similar sort of pictures emerging. But the point I want to get across, I guess, is that yes, uh, without treatment, uh, this group uh, is likely to have lower success rates, but it's not a homogeneous picture. It depends on what other things are going on at the same time, including depression. Let's move on to look at the issue of interest in taking up the offer of help. Is there, is there interest in this group? Are they going to take up the offer? Well, the first thing to remember is that, yes, most people want to stop in the general population, but even in the general population, interest in receiving help with stopping smoking is not that great. In England, for example, we just analysed data from our large surveillance um, programme that we've got, and we found that uh, about 10% of smokers who are offered help from their GP with quitting will try to stop as a result of being offered that help. 10%, 1 in 10. And they think, well, that's not very good. And from the GP's perspective, uh, it seems like most of their advice is falling on deaf ears. But how long did it take the GP to give that advice? On average, about 30 seconds. Uh, that's about what it usually takes in, the, in uh, a, a, com a conversation in, in Britain. That's uh, that's about a million smokers, if everyone did it, a million smokers. If their success rates are even just the average for, um, uh, for unaided cessation, that'll be about 5% uh, in a year. You're looking at uh, something in the region of 50,000 people um, quitting as a result of this, uh, this intervention nationally. So even though the percentages are quite small, the absolute numbers involved are high, and the cost effectiveness is just off the scale. Um, so uh, it, 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 worth bearing in mind as a clinician, when it seems like your advice and, and is falling on deaf ears or it's just not working, it probably is, and it doesn't have to work very much for it to be very impactful and important. Um, what we also find is that heavier smokers are just as likely to respond as lighter smokers. We also find that people who do not have smoking-related disorders, who are healthy and fit and not cur currently suffering from a smoking-related disorder, are just as likely to respond uh, as people who have smoking-related disorders. And very importantly, particularly for the present discussion, people from the lowest socioeconomic groups, the poorest and most disadvantaged groups, are just as likely to respond as people from the more middle-class backgrounds. What, kind of, what does this advice look like? Well, in, in Britain now, we don't adopt what uh, the Americans have coined as the five A's model because most clinicians in Britain can't remember five A's. Uh, so, uh, but apart from that, two of the A's aren't really that important anyway. Um, so you ask, obviously, can I check? Are you still smoking? How's it going with the smoking? Uh, you advise. The advice is not... I advise you to stop smoking. The advice is, do you know, whether you, whether you try to stop or not is entirely up to you, but do you know the best way of stopping is with a combination of behavioural support and medication. Is that something that would interest you? So it's not a confrontational thing, and it's not telling people what to do. It's doing what you do as a clinician, which is, which is saying, you know, these are, this is the best way to do it. It's, it's entirely up to you whether you take it up. And what we find is that that approach leads to higher quit rates and higher uh, numbers of people attempting to stop than just advising people. And then you offer the assistance you, and you promote it. And what you find is that this kind of advice, these are, these are data that I, I'm going to show you a few slides like this from uh, meta-analyses, the Cochrane Reviews, um, and uh, synthesis of Cochrane Reviews. Um, and what I'm going to show you are uh, graphs with bars on them, and the bars are the 95% confidence intervals. So where there's a very small bar, that's because a lot of studies have been done, so we have a very narrow confidence intervals, and where there are large bars, it's where there are wider confidence intervals. And what you see uh, in the top part of the, gra uh, of, the of the slide is that, yes, there is a small but highly significant effect for brief advice, very clear, there's no question about it, and if you provide a little bit more extensive advice, yes, you can improve that. But Paul Aviard, in the bottom part of this slide, and I and others, um, reanalyzed the Cochrane data and found that it was the thing that really gave you the most bang for your buck was not advising people to stop, it was offering help, 
offering help and support. That was the thing, and we've, we found that also with our uh, surveillance surveys, that it's the offer of help that gives you the big, biggest bang for your buck. Now, if you haven't got help to offer, you can't really offer help, so you've at least got to have that as a starting point. Uh, we find very little difference, as I've uh, mentioned before, across the social grade in terms of the uptake. So the overall figure is around 10%, and you can see that right across the social spectrum, from A, B, which is the professional managerial, to E, which is our uh, people uh, who are unemployed, long-term unemployed, and um, in the lowest paid occupations, there really isn't any gradient there. Um, so we can, be we can be confident that we're not exacerbating health inequalities through this um, and that, uh, that we will get a response in the people who are most disadvantaged. Um, you also find an interesting uh, pattern in relation to age with just one age group, the 25, 25 to 34, it should say there, uh, age group being slightly less uh, responsive than the other age groups, but the younger people and the older people being more responsive. What about in people with alcohol and substance use disorders? Um, a number of different studies have been conducted, and I'm just going to quickly rattle through them. But you can see that Ellingstad in back in 1999 found that a majority of smokers in treatment for alcohol use disorder said that they'd probably be interested in help with stopping either during or after uh, treatment for their alcohol use disorder. Um, Clark found that uh, there's at least moderate levels of interest. Um, Stotts in 2003 found that smokers in treatment for alcohol use disorders appeared uh, more motivated to abstain from alcohol than they were uh, uh, abstaining from cigarettes or getting help with cigarette smoking, which is not surprising because that's why, they were in, that's why they were in treatment. They didn't come for help with stopping smoking. That's worth bearing in mind. Um, and Joseph in 2003 found, did find considerable interest in uh, smoking cessation in people who were being treated for alcohol dependence. And in 2004, um, she found that uh, a nuance on this, again, that people with depressive symptoms were less interested in stopping smoking. And so the, the picture goes on um, uh, until the sort of present day, but essentially the picture is that, yes, there is interest, but it is variable, um, and what we don't know, and I can only surmise, is whether that level of interest is really any lower than it is for the general population. Remember that it's only 10% of the general population who are taking up the offer of help. So we can't, you know, we, we, we mustn't raise our expectations unreasonably. We must, rem but we must remember that even a small response is going to give us uh, a lot of lives saved. So now I'm going to go on to talking about how we can help people stop. And I want to start with just giving you a very general framework for behavior change that we use in my group and, uh, and is now increasingly going to be used in a number of different areas. And it's just recognizing something that's been known for thousands of years and been expressed in many different ways, but we've just uh, put it together in a kind of more of a systems model. And that is that if you want to get anyone to do anything, Three conditions have to be present, and we have to remember that all of these need to be present in order for change to occur. People have to have the capability to do it, the psychological and physical capability. They have to have the opportunity, the, the, the environment needs to be conducive to them doing it, and they have to be more motivated to do it than they are at that time to do something else. Um, and these things interact with each other. So when you provide people with the opportunity, it affects their motivation. When you provide people with the capability, it affects their motivation. And the whole thing works as, as a dynamic system. And you can create virtuous circles within that system. In the case of smoking cessation, um, what we're looking at in our uh, um, attempts to try and help people uh, to stop smoking are, for example, building capacity for self-regulation, helping people to understand the benefits of cessation, even if they may not understand it. We, we can't take it for granted that everyone knows everything there is to know about the benefits of smoking cessation, because most people actually don't. For example, you probably didn't know that a day's worth of smoking loses six hours of life expectancy until I mentioned it. Um, we need to inform them about the best ways of quitting. Most people in Britain think that the most effective way of quitting is through willpower alone, which is the least effective way of quitting. So there's still a knowledge gap there. Um, in terms of motivation, we, we have a persuasion job to do, to make people feel, to, to desire uh, smoking cessation, to make, help them to feel that quitting's worthwhile by, for example, uh, 
uh, uh, I, I was very struck actually at the symposium that, um, that I was at. Um, one of the questions from the floor talked about identity. I think identity is a fundamental driver of human behavior and we need to address the issue of identity. For example, we find that one of the biggest barriers to smoke, attempting to stop smoking in, in England are two things. One, and they're, they're, in, they're not independent, but they act, um, both of them are important. One is, I enjoy smoking. But the other one is, independent of that and everything else, is I like being a smoker. Okay, that's a, one of the biggest barriers. So this is an issue. We need to foster the desire to quit, which can be through intrinsic or extrinsic motivation. And very importantly, we need to tackle the urges. But there's also opportunity. And if we neglect that, then we forget uh, a huge swathe of what's going to be essential for successful quitting to occur. Uh, we've got to provide easy access to support. It's not enough to provide support you know, 100 miles away and, and expect people to do it. It's not, I, I don't think it's enough uh, to say to people, yeah, we, you can have your nicotine replacement therapy, or you can have your, what we know is the most effective form of way of using nicotine replacement therapy patch plus a faster acting form, but you're going to have to pay for it or you're going to have to pay for half of it. You know, for people who don't have a lot of money, that's not a very attractive proposition. Um, minimizing exposure to smoking cues. There's plenty of evidence that the way nicotine works to create dependence is by attaching urges to situations. We found in a study that we published earlier this year that even non-daily smokers, the vast majority of them, when they try to quit, will fail within a month. Non-daily smokers, surely they can't possibly be dependent. They can be dependent because their form of dependence is not one in which they need to keep their nicotine levels up in order to stay normal. Their form of dependence is that when they encounter a situation in which they would normally smoke, nicotine acting on the mesolimbic dopamine pathway has triggered a dopamine release, which is a teaching signal which tells them to experience the urge to smoke in that situation. And very importantly, to develop norms around quitting. We talk a lot about denormalization of smoking, and I know that this has happened quite a lot in Australia, as it has in Britain and in places like California. I'm not so keen on denormalization of smoking because I think if you're a heavy dependent smoker with drug and alcohol problems or mental health problems, the last thing you need is, as well as dying early and, being, and having all the other problems, is to be stigmatized by society. I think there's a serious cost to that. However, what you can do is normalize quitting and have it going on there in the soaps, out there in the environment, in, by staff uh, of, of centers and so on. Have it, have it something that's very visible and normal. Now, in the general population, we're very fortunate in, our, in the field of smoking because there's so many smokers and most smokers will turn up to our uh, uh, treatment trials and we can follow them up relatively easily. We have very, very good data on what, what is effective and how effective it is. And we know that with the optimal treatment program, we can achieve long-term outcome uh, quit rates, sustained biochemically verified quit rates in excess of 20% at a cost of around $500 per course of treatment, which makes it very effective. The main medication options are nicotine replacement therapy and Champix, varenicline. Of these, the, um, I'll show you the data uh, in a minute, but the, the treatments of choice are dual form NRT, which is a patch plus a faster acting form, or Champix, varenicline. And again, showing these 95% confidence intervals from uh, synthesizing the Cochrane reviews and presenting them in terms of risk differences, you can see that uh, varenicline is very important, is, is, is heading the, the field, dual form NRT uh, just behind, and single form NRT behind that. Single form NRT should not be our standard treatment now. It's like giving people beta blockers for blood pressure instead of giving them calcium channel blockers or ACE inhibitors. It's just not acceptable. So, you know, people die as a result of not getting optimal treatment. So this is important, and particularly for people who are heavily dependent. In relation to specialist behavioral support, we've got individual, group, and self-help. Um, and again, we see, uh, you know, clear evidence of efficacy. And you can put a kind of league table together of the kind of 52-week quit rates that you can expect with that group. If we apply this to people with alcohol and substance use disorders, I'm only going to sort of tachistoscopically flash through the slides and then give you the, uh, the bottom line. Because the bottom line is that uh, we don't have good, strong evidence which moves us from think to know in this group. 
but we do have enough evidence to make us think that it would be effective. And there are some interesting ideas and things going on. Um, what about the effects of stopping on, on the alcohol and substance use itself? Um, again, I'm going to flash through the slides to give you the bottom line. The bottom line is, with one exception, there was one study which Anne Joseph did, which found that people who were offered treatment concurrently with alcohol use disorder treatment had a lower success rate with um, alcohol uh, recovery than people who received delayed treatment. But all the other studies find either no difference or, in fact, a benefit to um, outcomes for alcohol and substance use treatment. And then finally, looking at how this uh, kind of support can be made routine, and again, going back to applying the, what we call the COMBI, com Capability, Opportunity, Motivation, Behaviour System to that, um, what we're looking to do is to ensure that there's the knowledge, the skills, the strength, the stamina um, in terms of capability, that in terms of the motivation, we have the plans, the evaluations, the conscious stuff, as well as the, as well as the feelings, the desire to do it on the part of the staff, and the um, low-level motivations. And very importantly, the systems in place, um, which provide the availability, accessibility, cues, and social concepts. And there's been a certain amount of research in this area looking at what is, uh, uh, what is effective and the bottom line is that I think we can say that with a systems-led or systems-focused approach, we can be reasonably confident that we could make a change. But on its, not necessarily on its own, you have to change the motivation and you have to change the capability at the same time. So what I think um, at the end of all this is that, yes, stopping smoking will substantially increase life expectancy and improve quality of life. That demand for treatment is probably going to be broadly similar to what it is in the general population. So don't get your hopes up that everyone is going to come beating a path to your door for this treatment. Um, it doesn't matter because for every two people that are treated who stop as a result, you've saved a life. Um, that the ch chances of a client stopping without support are very limited, but I think there's reasonable evidence to, be, uh, to, to believe that the treatment would make a difference. Um, offering st stop smoking support is unlikely to damage their chances of recovery from drug and alcohol uh, disorder uh, and may improve it, and that it is practicable, but we need to, find, we need to do work on finding the optimal systems. Um, what research do we need to do to take this forward? I'm not going to go into the details there, but one of the things I want to just say as a point of philosophy is that, going back to what I said at the beginning, is that maybe we should be rethinking our research strategy to help us to think more things than to try to know things that we can't know instead of think. Do you get that? <laughs> to think more things instead of trying to know things we can't know. Anyway, and leave you with this slide, which is, so, after all that, uh, should we be off routinely offering support for smoking cessation? The same questions before, the same response options. My, you won't be uh, surprised to know that my answer to this would be the third one down. Yes, of course we should. I mean, we, we offer it to other people routinely, Really, are we going to discriminate against uh, people with drug and alcohol problems? Um, there, is reasonable uh, uh, there is reason to believe it would make a difference, but we should be researching it, not to move think into no, but to think about more effective ways of achieving it. Thank you very much.